the library to accept the law. And I want to welcome you today to our second NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program workshop. Last year, we did have some success. Um, there were many people who were in the workshop last year who applied. Half of the people who were more than half of the people who attended. We had about 64 people last year. More than half applied. And um, this past year, 20, we received 20 awards at UF, which was more than double the average over the past five years. So simply by attending the workshop and getting inspired and understanding how to do this work, people apply, which is the first step to getting the proposal funded, right? If you don't apply, you don't get funded, right? So turn to your neighbor, give them a high five, and say, you're an NSF award winner. <laughs> go, 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 go. <laughs> Matt's slides are right here, 
and Doug is going, has his slides, and we're going to load his slides uh, tomorrow. And here we have Christie's award-winning application. Okay, it's linked to the institutional repository at the libraries. So actually, I want to congratulate Christie. She's the first student to submit her publication grant um, to the University of Florida Institutional Repository. And that will be there in perpetuity until humans don't exist. So let's give her a hand. <laughs> Our attempt is to make this as transparent as possible, and um, it was really great that Christy understood the merits of sharing her application with everyone. So I think that's all I'm going to give, and I'll turn it over to Doug who will um, do this presentation. So check back here next week. You'll see the video will be up. And I will send you an email. And you will then be connected. And you'll send me your questions. We will not get through all the questions today, especially eligibility questions. If I could ask you to hold off on eligibility questions. Otherwise, it's just a one-to-one -one conversation. You have a specific problem. We want questions that most people will benefit from. So if you have eligibility questions, hold those for the email contact list. Okay. Thank you, Bess. Yes. Thank you for coming, everyone. So my job is to give you a perspective of what a reviewer looks for, likes and doesn't like, in going through this. And then Matt and Christy are going to give you more of a perspective of how to put together the individual pieces. Okay? And we'll overlap somewhat, but that's okay. Um, if we both if we all say the same, if you hear the same thing coming up time and time again, it's because it's important. All right? But I'm going to skip over some pretty important stuff that I assume they're going to cover in their, their pieces. So I've been on the other side of this reviewing proposals for about seven years. Um, and I've seen a lot of successful pr proposals. I've seen a lot of, I've seen more unsuccessful proposals, obviously. And I think I have a pretty good sense of, of what reviewers like and don't like. So again, that's where I'm coming from. I wanted to describe the review process to you first. You need to be able to picture this. It usually it takes place in DC once a year in the winter at a hotel. This is not an NSF panel. Uh, you're not allowed to take pictures because the reviewers are supposed to be anonymous. So. This is, this is a fake NSF review panel, but really, it, it's what it looks like. Um, you've got a big table, you've got 30 or 40 people sitting around, um, and they're all, uh, they're all experts in a general field. So I'm an ecologist, but there are lots of different types of ecologists, all right? And you've got all those different types of ecologists represented here. The first thing that we do is what's called a calibration exercise. Before we even arrive on site, we are given three or four applications from the previous year, and we're asked to review them and rank them. Not surprisingly, different people on this panel, it's a very diverse panel, look for different things, and those, those uh, applicants from last year are scored differently by different people. Oftentimes, the average is pretty similar to the average the previous year, but we discuss that as a group so that we can kind of get a sense for what's important for our particular panel and what we look for. And that essentially levels the playing field. Um, it's, a very, it's a very fair process overall. It's much more complicated than that. But the reason I'm telling you this stuff is I want you to be assured that the process, even though it does have faults, is about as, as fair as it can get. Um, we've got a huge number of proposals. We've got about three days to do them. It works out to about 15 to 20 minutes per proposal. So all the pieces of your proposal get read in 15 to 20 minutes. Is that enough? No. Um, but that's a fact of life. That's the way that it works out. Um, the proposals are assigned at random. So if I'm, I'm an ornithologist, but I am not allowed to go over and pick out all the ones that have to do with birds. Okay? I have to just grab the top three. And they might have to do sewer microbes. I mean, you just don't know. All right, so when you write your proposal, you're writing it to a general audience, in my case, a general ecologist. Um, within this 15 to 20 minute period, you not only have to read, think, and synthesize, 
you have to sit there at a laptop and you have to write out reviews and rank the proposals right then and there. And functionally what that means for you is that if everything in your proposal is not laid out crystal clear and very easy to get to, it's going to be hard for the reviewer to write this review and then assign a score. You always assign a score after you write the review. Okay? If you make this step hard, you created a hurdle in terms of the score that you're going to get. Conversely, if you make the reviewer's life easy, they're more likely to give you a high score. Um, and then one other thing, you are eligible, as you probably know, for three, in general, three consecutive years to apply for an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. You can apply as an undergraduate, headed to graduate school, you can apply the first semester you're in graduate school, or you can apply essentially your third semester, the first semester of your second year. As you might suspect, those who apply as an undergraduate really don't have their act together in general, as much as someone who's been in graduate school for a year. And so would it be fair for the committee to judge those equally? No. What we do is we take all the level ones, all the undergraduates, we discuss them, we rank them relative to each other, we put them aside, then we go to the next set, the level two. You've been in grad, this is your first semester in graduate school. We do that, and then we go on to level three, okay? And then we hand all those rankings to NSF, and NSF decides how many of these are gonna take, how many of these, and how many of those, all right? But you're competing with your peers. Right? If you're an undergraduate, you're competing with other undergraduates. Now, another thing about this, um, and I can say this, uh, th there are lots of, of uh, emotions and moods that go through this. You can imagine being locked up, not literally, but <coughs> figuratively locked up in a room for eight to ten hours. Um, and, and you're reading lots of really great stuff, by and large. It's exciting. You feel like you're going to, like you've got the ability to change somebody's life by giving them one of these awards. It's a big responsibility, and it's, it's fun. But at the same time, if you do an hour after hour, proposal after proposal, for three days, you get exhausted. You get irritated by little things that normally wouldn't irritate you. Um, and you get, you get bored if, if something isn't written well. Like All right? That's what you gotta fight against, okay? From a reviewer's perspective. You don't know whether you're going to get a reviewer on this side of the spectrum or that side of the spectrum. So it's got to be a good proposal. Okay, so advice. Um, this proposal is about you. Practically every other proposal you're ever going to write is about the science or engineering. All right? This is an exception. Graduate research fellowships are given to individuals. And NSF wants to create a new generation of scientists and engineers who are going to do great work and reflect the, the values of, of NSF, both on a personal level and a national level. So it's okay. In this particular application, you've got to be personal. You've got to speak from the heart. You, you've got to sound sincere. You've got to be sincere. Um, and you need the reviewer, at the end of the day, to feel confident that they know who you are, why you are who you are, in other words, you're not just BS, okay, how you got to where you are, and then that you've got a vision for what you want to do with your life and why it's important and how you're going to get there. All right, that's not easy stuff, but every successful proposal hits on these three things and weaves them together. And you know there are three components, a personal statement, a previous research, and a proposed research. Um, what part of the proposal do you think these things come into? Personal statement and, and previous research. Okay? It doesn't so much go into the proposed research. But these, these two parts are really important. Okay, you've got a statement of broader impacts, or a personal statement, and then previous research. Is this called a personal statement? <coughs> a personal statement is what I mean there. But it really is about broader impacts, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, we'll talk about it right now. What do you think the most common problem of, uh, of an applicant is? 
No, it's not bad grammar, actually. Broader impacts. Broader impacts, yeah. Um, bad grammar will kill you. You're right. Um, <laughs> but, but it's not as common as you may think. Um, this, these are pretty polished essays by the time they get to the, the panel. But broader impacts are, are hard. And they're not only hard for you, they're hard for me. I've been at it for a while. Um, and the interesting thing is that broader impacts are purposely defined in a kind of vague way by NSF because they don't want to make it formulaic. They want you to be innovative. They want people to think outside the box. They want to push science and engineering in new directions um, in terms of what you do as a scientist or an engineer that's outside the normal realm of doing research and publishing and doing all the things that scientists and engineers normally do. Um, what are some examples of broader impacts? How many people know what, what NSF means? Do you think you know what NSF means by broader impacts? Let me just see a show of hands. Oh my goodness. We have work. Okay. Matt and Chris, this is something you're going to get on more, right? Okay. Broader impacts, if you don't have this down, it's the kiss of death. Okay? I'm serious. You can have a really good uh, research statement, but if your broader impacts are plain vanilla or not from the heart or not innovative, it's good. you're going to make yourself uh, a very difficult candidate to give a high um, Here are some examples of broader impacts. And you should visit NSF's website. Um, they have examples of broader impacts. This just came off the top of my head. They've got others. Matt and Christy will have others. In the checklist, um, if there's a live link to the document that um, Doug is describing, so when you go to the website at the library site, you will find it on the checklist as a live link. And you'll be able to see the list of broader impacts that um, NSF gives you ideas. Yeah, but it's not a complete list. It's not a checklist, okay? Um, it's just ideas of things. So basically, a broader impact is anything you do outside the realm of what you would do in your lab or in the classroom in the university. That's a very broad definition of it. So community service, public outreach, uh, boys, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, um, volunteer events, especially volunteer events that have something, anything to do with your uh, professional interests. Um, Mentoring, uh, tutoring of kids, um, preferably not your brother or sister. There are people that have put that in there. I've got mentoring twice there, sorry. Um, if you've overcome hurdles in your life, um, the, oftentimes the way that you've overcome those hurdles counts as a broader impact. Um, so remember what I said about speaking from the heart and being personal, and giving personal details. Don't be shy about that. In order for your broader impacts to be believable, you have to convince the reviewers that you know what it's like to do cool stuff or to overcome hurdles. Or you need to convince the reviewers why you want to go outside of what, what, science, what people typically think the scientists and engineers typically do. Um, so whether you've got a disability or if you're, for example, in a field that is uh, very sparsely populated by your particular gender, be it male or female, that counts. Um, Social economic background, if you're the first one in your family to go to graduate school, mention it. That's important. Um, talk about yourself. Don't be shy about any of this. Okay? And really the best way to learn is through examples. So look at Christie's. I guarantee you it's good. I haven't seen it. Um, I'm going to give you an example from one of my students, the last three slides here, uh, and I'll let you see how that's structured, just to give you a sense for how it's done. And again, there's no, there's no prescriptive way of doing it. There's no one right way. There are lots of different ways, but it's got to be good, and it's got to be you. So let me tell you what I look for in a broader impact statement. Okay? And again, 
do it, do what feels comfortable to you. But what I look for, um, and what you often see in, in successful applicants, is something like this. That it starts with a statement of what you believe about a given topic, about a given broader impact, okay? This is what I believe. Um, and it has to have something to do with broader impact. Um, and then explain why you believe that. Again, it's personal, right? This cannot be generic. It cannot be um, just, uh, you've got to make it believable. You've got to make your beliefs believable. And that means that you have to explain why you, why you believe in that particular um, thing, that particular broader impact. Again, I'll give you an example, and I think it will become clear. Um, now, this uh, isn't that hard to do uh, if you have lots of examples and you've given it some thought. I, I'm pretty confident that all of you have somewhere some broader impact experience. Um, but from a reviewer's <coughs> point of view, um, the reviewer wants to be convinced that what you believe um, that, and, and what you say is important to you truly is. In other words, they want to see documentation. They want to see a track record of what you've done. It's one thing to believe in something important. It's another thing and a critical test to have actually done something about it. So you can say with all the emotion and authority that, for example, you think that middle school girls should have more interaction with chemical engineers, if you're a chemical engineer. Um, and you can lay out a very convincing case for why middle school girls drop their interest in, in science and engineering at that age. Um, and then if you go on to say, well, guess what? I'm a chemical engineer. I'm going to spend time with middle school girls. Um, I'm not going to really believe it. Um, I hate to be quite so blunt. But unless you have a track record, unless you can demonstrate to me that you've actually done something, not necessarily that, but something similar, okay, that you've got it in your gut, you've got it in your soul, um, I'm not going to believe, I'm not going to take to heart this stuff. All right? So you have to demonstrate you have a track record, and then you need to be very specific about what you're going to do if, if you're awarded one of these graduate fellowships. In fact, I wouldn't even say if you're awarded. I would just say, you know, this isn't enough for me. It's been very rewarding. I want to do something even more. And this is what it is. And the more specific you can be, the more believable it's going to be. So, you know, it, you, should, you shouldn't, for example, say, yeah, I may I may go to a middle school and, and talk to a bunch of girls sometime. Okay, what you want to say is, I have already made contact with Sarah Charbonnet at Westwood Middle School. She teaches this grade level. She has invited me next semester to come in and talk to this particular class. Okay, the more specific you make it, the more believable it's going to be. Okay, um, things do have to be perfect grammar-wise. Um, and they have to be very, very clearly laid out. Um, you don't want to bore the reviewers. Um, and the reviewers are going to be getting bored after a while. Um, so remember <coughs> that what these reviewers um, need to be able to do after they finish reading your proposal is write out a review. They need to type out comments about scientific merit and broader impact. The more easy you can make it for them to do that, the more likely you're going to get a high score. So when I say painfully, obviously organized, what I mean is you need to lay things out so that the reviewer, when they're typing their comments, can look over here and know exactly what, what you had in mind when you were talking about broader impacts or scientific merits. Use different fonts. Um, bring things out, make that document as, as visually stunning as you can. You can overdo it on graphs, tables, and photos, but what you want to avoid are huge chunks of text, okay? Because if you do that, you'll get that. Don't they um, require you to use tags in your own Yes. You can't use different fonts. You can use bold and underline. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can. Um, but you can't make the font too small. Um, 
As, write it in a friendly way. Don't assume that the reviewer is an expert in your particular field, because I guarantee you he or she will not be. All right? So write it in a very simple, straightforward way. Start from the basics. Avoid jargon. Make it easy for the reviewer. Don't try and sound as though you're super smart. Um, in that, uh, in the document about uh, your proposed research, you've got to have a statement about what's innovative. Um, you have to state hypotheses and goals. And you have to explain how you're going to test those hypotheses or meet those goals. And, and be very specific, OK? So be, be absolutely certain that this stands out, hypotheses. You know, put them in bold. Link them to other places in the document. Again, everything has to kind of build upon each other. Um, and then follow the directions. Otherwise, you'll get people being very annoyed at you. And follow directions. You'd be surprised at the number of people that, that don't follow directions. So there should be a statement, at least uh, last year, people were required to have a statement in their, in their uh, uh, proposed research that the research was their original research. Um, and at least half the applications didn't include that. All right. Is that in there this year? I didn't see that. Okay. But well, NSF might have given up on that because nobody <laughs> followed directions. But follow directions. A lot of people don't read the details. Okay. I am not going to read this to you. I've got, I think, three of these. This is a personal statement that speaks to broader impact. I'm going to let you read this uh, when you have finished. Just raise your hand so I can judge how quickly to go through. I'm not going to wait for everybody. Here we go.
your uh, application. And so the basic gist is, is number one, you need to demonstrate intellectual ability to do great research and to contribute basically to society in that way. And the prior impact you need to show that you have made and will continue to make contributions um, basically to the uh, broader, uh, to getting a more broad, I guess, a group of people to do science and basically make it science more popular and fun, and etc. And then it's just benefit society. So, as Dr. Levy said, the bar impacts are a huge, huge, very important part of these essays. And I can tell you that in um, the last couple of years, I've probably held, I probably held maybe 10, 12 students. And there were two particular students I can think of who were the most exceptional academically of that group. And neither of them won in SF. And it's because they had basically nothing on broader impacts. You know, we're talking 3.95 plus GPAs, you know, GREs and the 1500s, things like that. Like that. And, uh, and they didn't win, and I got front of the loops because they just didn't have anything here to say. So this is very important. Um, so I want to stress, because I know, I know there's this one student that I know personally who's not applying this year. If you happen to be in here and you're not applying this year, you should definitely keep this in the back of your mind moving forward. And even if you apply this year and you're not sure if you're going to have enough for this year, go ahead and prepare for next year and get involved in some broader impact stuff. That, um, you know, not number one, that'll make you feel good about yourself, and number two, that you can rise up. So I'm going to give you essay tips on each essay as I see it. Um, first, we'll start with some general ones. And along the way, I've got a reviewer down here. And since I've been involved in a bunch of essays, I have kind of a database that I keep. And I've got a lot of the reviewers' comments. And so I'm going to kind of pull some comments out of the reviewers have made on things that people have said so you can kind of see what's going on in their minds. All right. So number one, the essays, uh, they'll make or break you. So now I guess GRE isn't even taken. So that used to be one part. Um, GPA, of course, is important to show that you've got academic ability, but I mean, it comes down to the essays. Um, you should definitely follow the essay prompt and the, and the target evaluation criteria the whole time you're writing it. So you've got the prompts on uh, one page here, you've got the evaluation criteria on another page. So as you write, you should be paying attention to that, and when you finish, you should go through and check mark all these things to be sure you fit everything. So let's give you some examples of what reviewers say about people that did and didn't do that. Um, this person did not go in depth on outreach activities or his personal perspectives and plans to translate the technical research into societal impact. So basically this person didn't do anything broader impact as well. Um, here's a person who uses I quite a lot to demonstrate accomplishments rather than the teams. So this goes to um, under under intellectual merit or maybe both of them, it talks about being able to do things by yourself and in teams. So they do pay attention to these things. Um, being memorable, obviously they're going to read tons of essays, so anything you can do to be memorable is important. So I'm going to give you an example from two essays. This is not the absolute best example, but I, I had two essays that talked about a similar topic, and I thought one was more memorable than the other, so I wanted to show you. So number one essay. As a weekend volunteer in our Gator Tracks program, I have had the pleasure of teaching grade school students basic concepts of math, science, and engineering. So this sounds pretty good. He's volunteering on the weekends, and he's teaching grade school students, and he's teaching them math, science, and engineering. So this is a broader impact to hopefully bring more students into the science and engineering fold. Here's another essay on the same topic. I participated in the U.S.-sponsored Gator Tracks program designed to reverse the decline in graduating engineers in the United States. I spent Saturday mornings teaching blah, 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 math, science, and engineering. So basically the same sort of stuff. So I don't know, who, which do you think is more memorable? Left or the right? Why? Which, which, what is the, what is the reviewer going to pull out of that particular essay? That, yeah. Possibly sees two greater impacts as opposed to one. Sees what? Two greater impacts. Not only the children, but also looking out for the nation as well. Yes, exactly, exactly. So this person has taken the same activity and they've um, basically expanded the broader impact by showing that they thought about this bigger picture item. So let's see what the reviewer said. It's commendable that you were thinking about the declining graduate, graduate trends in the United States. So this person got more bang for his buck with the same activity. So, and that's one example of being memorable. Um, always express ex excitement and be positive. Um, I'd say never use I hope, always use I will. You don't want to ever sound like you're not sure. Even if you're not sure, you need to sound sure. So always sound like this is absolutely what you want. I will do this. And inevitably, you probably will because you can get your, you can get your uh, NSF award and then you'll 
computer. Um, revise, revise, revise. He already told you that uh, background will kill you. Um, you just have to put in the time and do revision after revision after revision. And when you're done revising and you think it's great, then you have some other people read it. Uh, maybe a past winner, if you know one. Maybe your professors. Maybe somebody that a classmate that happens to be particularly good with writing, and uh, and then revise some more. So um, one of the winners, uh, maybe two years ago that I worked with, he must have revised his uh, his essays like 12 times, 14 times. So definitely put in put in the work there. All right. So you know, on the specific essay tips, um, on the research proposal. Uh, your, your first goal is to clearly place your proposed research within your field. So this is big picture stuff. Uh, what is the novelty? What is the impact? And when I say impact, um, that uh, broader impact kind of goes into that. So it's the impact of the research on your field. It's if the impact of the research on the broader community. Uh, if you can get all these things across, then that's, uh, that's huge. So here's, here's what our viewers said. The plan, this is a comment on what, um, what you know, someone had written. The plan should address explicitly the novelty of the proposed approach. This person didn't hit novelty. I think I got that one here. Um, focus on improving crop yield and agricultural development has potential broader impacts. So this is actually from Christie's essay. And um, so they specifically picked out, you know, that this person had said they want to improve crop yield. Christie said this, and that has broader impact than she had, she had said that it, it would. And so they picked that out and, um, you know, that, that helps your score. Um, you should talk about support taking the research proposal. Uh, for instance, uh, what kind of expertise do you need to, to have or do you need to be exposed to? What kind of courses um, would you need to do this work? What kind of equipment would you need to do this work? Um, you can't just say I'm going to do this fantastic research work if you haven't thought. I mean, if it requires million dollar equipment, you have to kind of think about, well, who has the million dollar equipment? Where would I go? You don't necessarily have to, you don't necessarily have to go there. You just show that you thought about it. You know, these schools um, have the kind of resources I would need, that sort of thing. So here's some, here's some comments from viewers on that. Um, this person is familiar with available resources at the postgraduate school. So they, they said that they, uh, the graduate school everyone applies to had what they need. Um, consider the kinds of facilities available and how they might contribute to the success, success of the project. So this person did do that, and the reviewers tell them that should. Um, don't be too technical. This is this is hard when you get kind of deep down in the nitty gritty of a research topic. You, ju you just have to kind of step back and um, remember that the best essays are usually accessible. So people like like Dr. Levy said, a broad scientific audience should be able to read them and enjoy them. And even even better if a slightly less scientific audience could also read them and basically get the gist of what you're saying, then you probably got an even better essay. Um, I always tell people when I look at their essays to limit the jargon and the acronyms. A lot of times people like to define acronyms early in their essay. They'll say a word, they'll put the acronym, and they never use it again. So all that does to me is just make the essay harder to read because you got all these acronyms you don't, you don't you only use again, you don't need to know, and you've got them out there, and it's just slow and confusing. So I, I always recommend that you don't do that. And if, if you, you can avoid overly technical jargon in, in favor of simpler terms that more people will understand, I highly recommend that. Diagrams and pictures, avoid uh, swimming in text. Um, and another thing is don't let your professor write it for you. So it may be that you come up with the kind of research topic and you write your essay and you give it to whoever you most closely associate yourself with as an undergraduate. And the professor might tell you, oh, you should put this in, you should put this in, you should put this in. You need to kind of have a filter in that kind of situation because you don't, you don't want it to, to appear as if your professor is basically feeding you everything. You know, we need to show some independent thought and kind of filter out well, what what would I realistically you know know to, to do at this stage things like that um, and don't you know, don't let them give you like proposals they've written or something for you know for their own work and have you basically water that down just you know be original don't let your professor um, provide too much support if they're um, if they're trying to so on the personal statement. Uh, Dr. Levy covered this. I mean, you want to open up what are you about, what makes you tick. Um, my personal opinion, the childhood wonderment angle is a little bit tired. Every essay I read, I read, like I said, probably 12 of them for, for various students. They all talk about, oh, you know, I built my first Lego castle and I knew I wanted to be an engineer, this and that. Um, there's a little bit of that in that essay that Dr. Levy just showed, but that was very well done. 
you know, he, he was a child, but he was out with his dad, and then he went directly into all this um, forestry stuff. So just don't, I think just don't make it too sad. Just, it's, it's a little bit tired, and I'm going to show you like two examples of a similar, um, of a, of a similar <laughs> topic that I've covered in two completely different ways. So here's one person that says, as far back as I'm able to remember, I've been intrigued at the thought of flight. Well, there's nothing particularly wrong with that sentence. Um, I mean, he gets across what he wants to get across. He, he likes flight. He's been interested for a long time. But it's, there's nothing really memorable about it. Yeah. So um, here's another person. And they did more of a narrational uh, thing. They said, I could feel the drone of the aircraft engine pulsing through my chest almost as strongly as my quickly beating heart. And they talked about some more airplane stuff. And that really, you know, you get into it with them. Like, obviously, this person is crazy about airplanes because they're giving me this great narration. And I remember that. You know, this other one, I had to go back and find this essay to find that quote. But this one, um, from a student that uh, I read essays for a couple years ago, I remember specifically which student wrote that particular line, and I knew where to find it. So, um, that sort of thing is what I want to do. Um, and then, on your personal statement, you know, when you're hitting your broader impacts, uh, you want to hit past outreach activities. And I think one good way to do this, which is basically exactly what Dr. Lewis said, is you kind of use... Um, you use past outreach to support future plans and ideas for outreach. So let me give you an example. This is also from Christie's essay. I feel that I can successfully serve as a mentor to young women because of my experience as a residential advisor. Sophomore year, I blah, 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 what she did as a residential advisor. So here she's um, talked about what she wants to continue doing or, or do, and she backs it up with a prior uh, thing that she's done. So that's very important in building um, kind of a belief in And broader impacts huge in the first step. Um, in your prior research essay, I, I think one of the important thing is to show technical competence. So you want to show them that uh, you have been a very capable researcher and you will continue to be a very capable researcher. And some of the things you can highlight are uh, valuable contributions you made, uh, specific achievements, uh, leadership in the group, uh, communication of your results. So I'm going to hit on that last bullet because I saw a lot of reviewer comments and the various reviews that I've got in my database where um, reviewers talked about this. So here's an example. Currently working on papers to be published. So this person had written their essay, they were working on a paper, the reviewer seized on it, and that's a, that's a, huge, um, that's a huge feather in your cap if you're uh, a researcher. The research findings have been presented to the sponsor, student participated. So here the, the student has been engaged with the sponsor. They've, uh, they've communicated some results. They obviously must be a value member of the team if they were even allowed to, you know, say anything to the sponsor. So that's 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 great. Um, this this advisor, uh, this reviewer encourages you to have faculty or grad student mentor you. Have faculty or grad students mentor you on writing a publication, even to a student conference. So this person maybe hasn't really hit on communicating what they've done, and so this this. Uh, this reviewer is saying, hey, this would have been a great thing to have to have And uh, you should be on the lookout for these student conferences because there are oftentimes kind of um, low pressure, local ways within the university you can kind of go off and show off what you're doing, and that's a great <coughs> thing to be able to write about. Yeah. Great. And that's, uh, that, was, that was it. There's uh, my total presentation. I have another slide uh, that I won't cover right now on uh, letters of recommendation. So you can get that on there.
besides the thirty thousand dollars and the speech. Um, first of all, uh, you'll fully understand the project that you're writing about in your proposed research, and I think that this is very valuable if you're like me and you were doing a rotation um, and you weren't sure that you were going to join the lab. So it's great to uh, have in writing what you are going to be doing if you join the lab, what your graduate career is going to be like, and what your training, what training you're going to get. Um, additionally, if you know you're joining that lab, you're, it gets your mind rolling about what uh, you need to do in the future as it um, And then also, it gives you practice talking about scientific projects start to finish in your previous research experience. Um, and the more practice you have with that, the better it is, because that's an important skill you need to learn in grad school. And also, it gives you, uh, this application gives you practice identifying a gap in knowledge and planning a series of experiments, and this is also in the post research. And honestly, this is why I applied to the MFF um, And I hope that you keep these things in mind, too, because I knew that sometimes I get discouraged because chances of getting it off that high, but if you write your application and you turn it in, you will be getting these benefits, no matter whether you win the award or not. Okay, so things I learned when I, after I wrote my first statement, um, you need to clearly state why you've chosen your area of research in your graduate program. Um, one of the reviewers said that I, I haven't clearly identified the no rationale for that, so that's the thing I Don't make my mistake and uh, neglect the obvious parts of the past. If you're looking to go into uh, academia, make sure you say that you're going to be training graduate students to be scientists in the field and that you're going to go to conferences and, and publish. Um, one of the reviewers uh, mentioned that in my, um, in my review. Um, and once again, there's no such thing as broad impact. I tried really hard to really plug that into all my essays, but still, uh, the reviewer said that. Um, which also, which also shows that your essay doesn't have to be perfect to get the award, because I, I got a lot of feedback and things I could have done in my first. Uh, okay, so um, the structure of my personal statement, I started out with a story about, um, that really underlies why I chose to switch fields uh, of research. So, can everyone still hear me? Okay. Um, so, as a sophomore in college, I was a molecular biology major, uh, wanting to go into cancer genetics research. And uh, I took a wetland ecology class one semester because all the molecular biology classes were full. Um, and the first field trip of this class, uh, our professor took us to this bog in central New York. And the landscape had an enormous impression on me. It was just beautiful. And I, I kind of fell in love with the, the natural area that was there. Um, and I decided over the next few weeks that um, I wanted to do something with my background that could preserve these areas. So um, by, in an ideal world, if you increase the crop yield, uh, you prevent the farmland from encroaching on these natural areas um, so that they can, as many as possible, can remain preserved. So that was my story. In my opening paragraph was I talked about you know the sensory, the senses that I had, my waders getting stuck in the mud and eating cranberry and blueberries and like, the smell of the sulfur in the wetlands. Um, and the rest were uh, broader impact applications, uh, as Dr. Lee was talking about. Um, my proposed research had opportunities for international collaborations in Brazil to strengthen uh, international ties in science. Also, I wanted, I'm, I'm passionate about including uh, women. I was, I, I've been disturbed by the fact that women aren't represented in uh, tenure professorships. So I talked about how I was a, a residential advisor for female floor and how I have experience with that and how I'll use that when I'm a professor. And same, um, I wanted to open access to underprivileged in science. Um, and I have experience, I had experience tutoring high school students as they were preparing to get ready for college and stuff. So I use that for what I would do, um, extrapolate that for what I would do um, for our professor. And I used the previous research experience essay to um, really talk about the journey it was for me to find my research interest. So every paragraph was a, a, a past project I had done. And um, I talked about how my own independence grew from project to project, how I was able to um, gain independence in developing hypotheses and uh, collecting data, interpreting conclusion, uh, interpreting results, and forming my own conclusions, and really being able to, um, at the end, my last project was my first rotation at UI. Um, and, and I was able to plan my own project. Um, 
And that was kind of the link that tied them all together. And really, I think, uh, if you haven't gotten that already, it's really important for you to be able to speak clearly about scientific results and their significance. Um, as my mentor, one of my mentors, Karen Poe, says, you have to be able to think clearly before you can write clearly, and that if you just do that by practice, writing and writing um, and revising. Okay, so um, for my proposed research essay, um, I started with a short introduction, and uh, something that I did when I was planning for this essay was I had this misconception that um, for the introduction I had to know everything about this deadline that I was writing about and my proposed research was going to be done. So I looked at, I had to look at all the journals and all the articles that I had written on it since it was discovered. Um, but when I actually sat down to write it, the, the part where I summarized the literature was only this big and 15 references took up half the page at the bottom and then the list I did and uh, it's not really uh, supposed to be um, comprehensive literature. You're just supposed to do target problems. But what I, what I did was um, a targeted uh, taking out of the literature of what was applicable to the project. Um, and then I went right into my research question, how does this sugar processing enzyme affect corn kernel development? And after, uh, so I guess to give you um, just a kind of an idea of what my summary of the current knowledge was, I started out with it, uh, saying that um, understanding trigger signaling in corn would help, could help uh, improve its in crop yield, and then how trigger signaling is unexploited by development. The examples of how this enzyme uh, is known to act in different species, and then um, the enzyme adaptation of our species. Um, so then I have some three specific aims. Um, the first one is centered on the enzyme, the second is centered on the sugar molecule itself and its signaling potential, and the third is uh, looking at this gene and its conservation across different grass species. And what's important for each of these, I think, is that you're able to get, you have to strike a balance in the right level of detail you go into um, and talk about the methods you're going to use, um, your predicted results, and uh, the significance, or why you're using these methods specifically. Um, and also, any, as a map said, any uh, labs that whose expertise you're going to rely on, um, you should have mentioned those here too. Um, and finally, for reviewers, in terms of reviewers, I, I suggest you guys get diverse uh, perspectives, um, especially professors who have very uh, broad perspectives on the field, and they can tell you, they can advise you, um, guide you, we'll say, on um, the methods of treating and methods that's inefficient. Um, so at the same time, you want to be to do So I'm trying to strike that balance. And uh, if you can, allow the time for the reviewers to come in and to act on their comments. I waited really until the last minute and I was running around the night before to comment, to reviewers' comments that I was trying to work out. But uh, if you ever panic at doing this process, I think it would be okay. I was definitely panicking when I sent it in. I think it's just normal and um, I hope you guys all apply it and I hope uh, I had some things that were out for you.
Take credit. Yeah, you want to take credit for the work that you're doing yeah. or the work that you've done. Take credit for that. Yeah, the timing doesn't matter. It really doesn't. As long as you've got the experience under your belt, that's the important thing. So for the three letters of recommendation you need, should they be exclusively from scientists? Or if you had a really great humanities professor that knows you really well, can that apply even though that person isn't a scientist? Uh, I, these are going to be read by scientists. And the scientist is therefore going to have more clout uh, because they know what it takes to be a scientist and can reflect on your particular skills and personality traits. I wouldn't say avoid the humanities teacher, um, but I would, certainly wouldn't have two humanities teachers in there. If you think that teacher has something unique to offer, then yes. What you want to avoid, and it's rare, but it happens, is a letter of recommendation from the night shift manager of Shoney's from when you were in high school. <laughs> so what I've learned about this is they've changed the rules on the letters. The letters must be uploaded to the Fastlane account that you're going to register immediately. All of you should just register for a Fastlane account as step one in my checklist, right? Um, every person who is going to write you a letter must be entered into your Fastlane application with their email, okay? But they also have to register in Fastlane in order to upload their letter to your account. And there won't be a place for them if this person isn't registered within NSF. So it's another way of saying NSF wants people to write letters who are already in the universe of the NSF funding model. And um, if you go outside of that, they have to register in Fastlane and it might cause you some grief. You can go in there and see if they've uploaded their letter. You can't necessarily read what they've written, but you can see if they've uploaded their letter. Correct? Um, if there's questions about that, you can hound the people that I put phone numbers on there and email. This is an outside contract. So NSF has an outside contract with a group of people who are managing this because it's too big and too complicated for them to manage in house. So these are not regular program officers that you're calling on the phone. These are people who are paid to manage this NSF fund. So call them, call them. I spent 20 minutes trying to understand how this was going to work if the letters were due at the same time as the application. And she was fine with me being as explicit as possible to help me understand how all of this was going to happen. Another question. Yes. So there's a limit of three letters. How realistic, if you do have more than three letters, um, sometimes people will include more just so that they have backup in case one of the letter letters. So will they look at that fourth letter? Or I don't it, think you can even upload more than three letters. You only have to put five. They allow you five names. Oh, yeah. In case they don't first add right. You write exactly. them, will they will they only look at your top three and they're like, how likely is it will they yeah, it doesn't work like Can you rank those? Yes. Yes. Good. I'm glad that people are playing in there. Yeah, you guys so, know more about this than we do. That's a good sign. Yes, I'll take you and then uh, back to you. Um, when, are you reading, or is a reporter reading the letters of recommendation like side by side with your essays? Yes. Okay. Everything is read in that 15 to 20 minute period. Okay. I'm kind of planning to do my research abroad. It would be beneficial to get like a letter from someone in that country? It like, would be beneficial if they know you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if they know me and they support my research. Yes, then that would be, I, I would recommend that. NSF really likes international experiences, and this is what counts. So especially, especially if you can stay in your essay and the review and the letter writer can stay in their letter, why it's important for you to get this international experience from reviewers. But I consider the equivalent of research and In 
it helps you. Um, right here, and then back to you, and then to you. Go ahead. Uh, would it be particularly dangerous to reveal any political affiliations? I think it would be inappropriate. Okay, next. Um, if you want to apply this to two years of a master's degree and then one more year for a PhD project, do they check if it's on the exact same topic? No? Okay. No. There are no proposal please. In other words, if you get this, you've got it. They're never going to go back and say, you said this in your essay, but you know what, you're doing this now, give it back. Never, so, never so you can ask. use it to split for like two years of masters and then one. Year I wouldn't even years. go. I wouldn't even go into what funding you're going to use for what. I would just say this is what I want to do and let them figure out the details. <laughs> <laughs> Over here, um, well, I understand you don't use it at U.S. institutions, but are there opportunities to take it outside? It, on the website, it says that there's like notes about the company. I'm really surprised. These go to individuals rather right. than institutions. Right. They changed this year. I called them. Really? Yeah. It goes to the institution. No, it both well, goes to you, but you can only use it at the U.S. institution. Uh huh. Okay. So you have to be enrolled in this institution and in the U.S. That makes sense. So if you're going to go abroad, you have to be enrolled in a in a graduate program in a U.S. institution and do your work abroad. If that's how you're going to do it. Yeah, that shouldn't be hard to do. There, there are people yeah. that enroll in the U.S. and then do work affiliated with so other institutions. So you could work at another. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Question. Yes. Um, is there an undergraduate GPA where where a viewer may not take your writing as like if you there are no a, limits. Where would you be in it? I mean, realistically, are you okay. going to read them with the same, you know, um, thorough eye? The, the way that it works is everything is printed out. It's hard copies. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's not electronic. And they are ordered so that your transcripts and your GREs, if they're there, come at the very end. Okay. Okay, so in general, reviewers have already got an idea and formed an opinion of you before they look at those grades rather than after. Um, so there are certainly people with very good grades who don't get them. There are people with modest grades. So 3.0 is not out of the question. Below 3.0, you have a very hard time. And 3.0 is not, a, you know, it's not rigid. But the lower your GPA, the harder it is to get one of these. But it can be done, so don't pack yourself out. I, I can say I've got a spreadsheet uh, that was given to me from some of the graduate school for all the, UF, all the UF winners from like 2000 to 2007. I think the average GPA was like a 3. It's real close to a 3.8, I think. So 3.7. But re really, from a reviewer perspective, the difference between a, a 3, 4, and a 3, 8 doesn't make any difference. So I just need to um, ask where the sign-up sheet is, because I'm really concerned that I, I, did everybody sign this? People came in late. Um, it never made it up here. So um, we're going to stop now. Please sign the sign-up sheet. I will send you an email. If you have questions, send me the questions.